Hello, everyone. Thank you for checking out the study of antiquity and the Middle Ages. I'm your host, Nick Barksdale, and today we are joined by a very special guest, Dr. Marancy. Dr. Marancy, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you so much, Nick, and I just want to applaud you on your channel. I've been checking it out, and you are doing such great work, and it's such a great service. Um, we all need to learn more about antiquity in the Middle Ages, and these days, it's such a comfort to be learning about <laughs> antiquity in the Middle Ages. Um, so thank you so much for this opportunity. Well, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to better educate ourselves. And to our subs today, I know many of you had requested some episodes on ancient medieval Armenia, and I was happy to oblige. And she is going to take us through ancient medieval Armenia. But what's really interesting about this is it's also going to focus a lot on architecture and structure, which in its own way gives you its own history. And so, Dr. Maranzi, I'm going to let you take it from here. I want to move ahead. Obviously, we could we could have many uh, shows on this, but um, I want to move ahead to the Urartiums. Okay. Now, many people learn in in school. Well, some people do about the Assyrians and the Persians, the Achaemenid Persians, Persepolis, etc. Less so about the Urartiums, but they're just as interesting as a major uh, imperial power. And um, they, they settled all over this Armenian high plateau region. Their focus was, um, their capital was centered around a lake that's now in Turkey um, called Lake Van. And you might have some cat fanciers out there. <laughs> uh, and very, the, the cat that, that's native to that lake is the Van cat, sometimes known as the Turkish Van or Van or the Armenian Van. And um, this cat, I just have to say this because my students are always interested, loves to swim and it has different colored eyes. So anyway, the um, the Urartians settle in this region and, and establish a wide base of power all over um, uh, Asia Minor. Um, they build citadels, massive citadels that are um, demonstrations of state power. They are demonstrations of, of um, iron tool technology. Um, and they are also places where we see Urartian writing. So we have from this period Urartian cuneiform. Cuneiform, the same um, writing system you see in, in Assyria, for example, but using the Urartian language. So we know from excavating these citadels that what they are um, doing with them a lot in, in a lot of cases is they are their residences, their, their expressions of power, their places of um, temples, but they're also storing goods. They have massive inventories. And um, archeologists have been struck by how extensive are the chambers of storage for various kinds of grains and wine. And, um, and all of these we know, all of this we know because these um, are carefully labeled. So if you know any, if there are any hoarders in your family, the Urartians would feel very comfortable with them because that's, that's essentially, they are, they were obsessed with massive scale storage and labeling everything down to what's in the, what's in the vessel and how much is in that vessel. Another very interesting thing about, um, about Urartian fortresses, and let me say a famous one um, that we can put up a picture, we can illustrate this later, um, is in uh, what is now the capital city of Armenia, Yerevan. Uh, the Urartian citadel is called Erebuni. And um, what we know from analysis of that site and, and other sites is that it's the Urartians were not only obsessed with storage, but also with control over how you move through the site. So there's actually been spatial analysis of Erebuni and sites like it by archeologists showing that you don't have a whole lot of um, choices when you go in those places. You can't turn, let's say, to the left or the right. You are, you are very controlled as to how you go through these spaces, suggesting surveillance, suggesting a kind of top-down approach to space. So very interesting um, analysis done uh, that tells us something about the Urartians. We also know from cuneiform about their religion. We know that their main god was Haldi, who was the god of sky, war, and the herds, often shown astride a lion. 
excavated from these fortresses were also beautiful examples of metalwork. So we know they were metallurgists as well. Um, and they worked in bronze. Um, some of what they do will remind people if they know the Assyrian palace sculptures of those Lamassu, these wonderful hybrid figures that combine um, parts of birds and lions and humans. And you see this as well in uh, Urartian metallurgy as, as well. Um, Urartians very much saw themselves as competing with the Assyrians to their south. And so you have a sense, I think, of a rivalry of these two empires um, and, um, and sometimes out and out warfare. So it's very interesting to think of them as competitive states and to understand the material culture of Urartu that way. But the interesting thing is that Assyria always gets the news and gets the play, and rarely do we hear about this northern state. But it was extensive, it was powerful, and it was materially very productive. So, um, but we don't know why the Urartian kingdom falls. So it falls um, in the seventh century, and it's still a mystery to scholars as to what exactly happened because it falls suddenly. And um, so there's this period of time where we don't, it used to be people would say the Medes um, came through, but, um, but that's debated now. Um, but what we do know is by the sixth century, Armenian, this high plateau area was under the control of the Achaemenid Persians. So another big imperial power, this time with its base in Persepolis. And Armenians became satraps or provinces or states essentially of the Achaemenids. And, um, and here too, we can still talk about excavations and we can talk about continued production of material objects uh, sometimes with very clear relations to the, the kind of um, uh, imperial art of Persepolis. And I will show you, um, when I send you images, the beautiful silver riton or ritual drinking vessel that was excavated um, in Armenia that speaks to the, those connections with Persia. And uh, as I often tell my students, you know, you can tell when they're from the ancient Near East because everything's tailored, you know, and... and uh, <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's all rather reductive, but but you can see in this wonderful write on that I'll show you a figure with you know close fitting tunic and sleeves and trousers and boots and actually visually very similar to the figures you see on the um, on in the uh, staircase relief at Persepolis. So so here we can see a clear shift from towards, let's say, Persian, um, a Persian sphere of power and a kind of cultural center of gravity. So um, the high plateau at this point is in the sixth to fourth centuries BC is looking towards Iran. Now, what's interesting is what happens by the fourth century. And in the fourth century, we have Alexander, Alexander the Great, so 331, BCE, Alexander conquers Persia, and we see a change in the landscape of the ancient world. And Armenia is no different. So Armenia becomes part of this vast network of power that's looking not to Iran anymore, because there's no more Achaemenid Empire, but is looking towards the Mediterranean. And so what's so interesting is that by the fourth century, third century, second century, first century, you see in the elite production of Armenians and, and let's say um, this pre-Armenia pre still, but the, the people of um, the Armenian plateau and the elites of the Armenian plateau, you see that uh, re, re-shifting or shifting towards the Mediterranean as a kind of a place of negotiation and contact and, and cultural exchange. So we have some very interesting material evidence for for this in the form of classicizing sculpture. Sculpture that you would think, oh, that's that's um, Hellenistic, that's coming right out of the Acropolis or something. Um, and then an example of an Ionic temple. The only um, classical temple that's known in the former Soviet Union is in, uh, is in Armenia. So these examples and Greek inscriptions and what we know from sources about, um, about uh, Greek priests, for example, at, in Armenian cities, we can speak about this very different orientation towards the classical Mediterranean. And that's what I mean when I say that 
Armenian, uh, ancient Armenia is not tidy. And it, it is, it's, it's actually a, a culture that's looking in so many different directions. And as I tell my students, this often is great because, you know, take an Armenian art class. You're going to learn about so many other things at the same time that you learn about Armenia. But it also means that it, Armenia doesn't show up in textbooks on ancient art or archaeology or architecture for that matter because it simply doesn't fit. I think that's exactly the reason why it's interesting, though. That's interesting. I mean, so by the first century, we have Armenia essentially creating a treaty with the Romans. So uh, at this time, there's a treaty, it's called the Treaty of Randia, and the King, King Tordat, or Tiridates, is crowned as king or as ruler uh, by Nero in the Roman Forum. And this is the um, beginning of the Arsacid or the Arshakuni dynasty in Armenia. I think already, if you talk to, to specialists, they would tell you that this period looks both to Rome, we can see this very clearly, and I'll explain why in a minute, but also um, is... Parthian. So the, Ar the Arsacid dynasty is by lineage Parthian. And so one of the, the interesting things about what, we're, what we've learned over the decades about Armenian, Armenians in this period is that they are culturally, they're ethnically, they're linguistically um, and religiously connected to Iran. And these, these bonds are still very much in place. So, so I think, uh, you know, a lot of specialists in ancient Armenia would talk about a kind of an elite stratum of Romanization, but you still have this strong connection to Iran. So that Zoroastrianism is by the first, I mean, that's the pre-Christian religion of the Armenians. Um, at the same time, you have this beautiful temple or tomb of Garni uh, from the first century. You have hypocaust by the third, fourth centuries being used in Armenia. You have, you have baths and mosaics and inscriptions, you know, in, in, um, in Greek that are speaking to this connection with the classical world. So that's, again, one of this kind of interesting, messy, I don't know, you know, point of a kind of duality between Rome and Parthia, between Rome and Iran um, during this late antique period. When it comes to especially the region of Armenia during like the Bronze Age, for example, and up to where you left off, are there any sources that you would recommend as far as like primary? Oh, wow. This is a yeah, tough one. You know, I have to say that uh, when I wrote um, my, I wrote a book on Armenia called The Art of Armenia, very basic, but um, writing the chapter on the ancient period was the hardest because of that, because there are really the, the number of local sources for the early period are, um, well, there, there aren't any in, in Armenian because the alphabet isn't invented until the fifth century. So that, that's kind of too bad. But, <laughs> um, but there's also, there's wonderful, I would strongly suggest looking at the archaeology. Okay. And I can I can send you some links to some wonderful studies of um, of the archaeology because I think that's the best way into this material. That and and the connection between the archaeology and the landscape. So I think those are those are good places to to work. And another thing is is looking at the Christian memories of the past. And you can do that through Christian texts that are written in the fifth century and even a little bit later. So there's a memory still of this past. Bronze Age is super interesting though. And I hope that if you just get online and if, you're, if your viewers could get online and look at some of these sites, they are amazing. And uh, you all need to go there. <laughs> That's true. And hey, uh, to my subscribers, Check out the links in the video description below, and I will include whatever she sends me will be there, so you can check it out from there. So.